don't know about you, but I don't know a lot about black exploitation films. I mean, I've heard about Shaft, but that's probably about the limits of my expertise on the topic. Funny enough, I've never even watched Shad. I just I just know about its existence. I love black cinema, but black exploitation films weren't really in circulation in my household when I was growing up. I did, however, watch a lot of hood movies when I was a kid, like uh, The Players Club, Friday, Baby Boy, The Wood. That era of black cinema will always hold a special place in my heart. And it's because of my love for black cinema that I decided to investigate black exploitation films a bit because I was kind of surprised. I'm like, when I thought about it, I was like, you know what? I really don't know shit about these films. And they were a very important part of cinematic history. So I was like, let's do it. But anyway, it was during my research that I realized that black exploitation films, they laid the groundwork for hood movies to even exist. Yeah, no shit Sherlock! And ultimately paving a way for films like Get Out or even Wakanda Forever. So if you're like me and you don't know shit about black exploitation films, let me give you a little bit of a background. Black exploitation is a genre of films that came about during the early 1970s that were meant to depict black urban life. And it was one of the many genres that became popular in grindhouse theaters. They featured predominantly black actors and targeted black audiences. And there are also subgenres within black exploitation films. You can have comedy, you can have horror, dramas, or musicals. And a lot of these films typically portray themes of violence, politics, sexploitation, and various stereotypes of urban life. The tastemakers of black exploitation cinema acknowledge Sweet Sweet Back's badass song as the first black exploitation film and really the catalyst of the genre because when it came out it wasn't really like okay guys this is a black exploitation film here you go that wasn't really the the purpose of this film and honestly i personally would argue to say that it doesn't really fit the mold of what we start to see represented as a a, a stereotypical black exploitation film but it was the catalyst for the movement and i also saw one or two other other films I believe that were argued to be the first black exploitation films as well but across the board usually you see Sweet Sweet Back's Badass Song as the first official black exploitation film. Sweet Sweet Back's Badass Song was written and directed by Melvin Van Peebles in 1971 and the film depicts the journey of a black man affectionately known as Sweet Back who becomes the target of a police-wide manhunt. Sweet Back becomes a significant film in cinema history because at that time there weren't many black films like at all it, it, it was sparse <laughs> And here was a film directed, written by a black man with an all black cast, except for the people who played police officers. But the core people, the main character was black, a rare occurrence during this time in history. And in addition to the fact that this was a film that was written with the purpose of portraying the black experience to the masses. Now, if we briefly take a look back in earlier cinema in history, you know, way before the black exploitation period even started. I'm talking about from the rise of Hollywood from the 1910s to the 1920s and then going all the way up to the 1960s. Very rarely did black or brown faces grace the screen and quite often if they did it was white actors in blackface because you know representation matters. For the lucky few black actors who were able to get roles, they were often relegated to one of many on a literal list of stereotypes, like the Mammy or the Uncle Tom. There's also the Sambo, the Sapphire, the Mandango or the Buck, the Jezebel, and the Tragic Mulatto, the Piccaninny. And these racist stereotypes were invented in an attempt to justify slavery and segregation. This is kind of off the beaten path a little bit, but but I just remembered when I was a kid, I used to watch this film called Cabin in the Sky all the time. My mother had a collection, well, she still has this huge collection of films and they're all on VHS. They're, they're old as shit. And a lot of her collection is related to black cinema. And Cabin in the Sky was one of the films that she had in her collection that I loved so much as a kid. Cabin in the Sky,
Sky was an American film adaptation of a Broadway musical that was released in 1943. And it features some of the greats of the time like Louis Armstrong, Ethel Waters, Lena Horne, and Eddie Rochester Anderson. Now this film, it did play up some of the aforementioned stereotypes that I talked about. Like for example, Lena Horne's character definitely fit into the Jezebel stereotype. But what made this film really stand out, because remember, this came out in the 1940s. This was an all black cast and they were all in roles that weren't beholden to white characters. Because typically in films back in the day, when there were black roles, there were black characters, a lot of times those characters they had relationships with white characters that were in some form submissive or supposed to be less than the white counterpart role. Cabin in the Sky wasn't like that. But I say all that to say that there were some examples where there were films that went against the status quo of the time. And I personally feel like Cabin in the Sky was one of those, but this was not the norm. This was not a regular occurring thing in cinema. So after that period of cinema where you have white actors donning on blackface and very little representation of black actors and black characters, and if they were featured in films or in them at all, typically they were relegated to a racist stereotype. After that period of cinema, black exploitation films became the next evolution of blackness in cinema. Even films that weren't close to the genre, but featured an all black cast, were marketed as part of the genre. White and black filmmakers alike capitalized off the genre from 1970 up to 1975. There have been debates about black exploitation films throughout the years. On one side, they create a space where black actors could get jobs. They also challenged Hollywood's racist status quo and the stereotypes that they pushed. But on the other side of the coin, often these films relied on violence, drug culture, and the hypersexualization of black women. So for this video, I decided to do something very similar to what I did for my baby burlesque video. If you haven't checked it out, you should check it out. I'm going to do a film review of a black exploitation film. We'll call this segment of Old Dirty History, the historic film review hour. So for our very first historic film review hour, I wasn't sure which film I wanted to go with. You know, one of the problems with black exploitation films is that there are so many of them. I mean, it is a long, 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 long list. I mean, do I go with some black exploitation horror like Blackula or maybe the notable Cooley High? There's also Shaft. Well, I decided to go with the film that I have talked about quite a bit already in this video. Sweet Sweet Beck's Badass Song. I figured, why the hell not? It sparked the entire genre. It is a very important film in black cinema history. I mean, shoot, it's important across all of cinematic history. Let's do it. Let's watch Sweet Sweet Beck's Badass Song. Now, before I watch the film, I wanna give you guys just a little bit more information specific to Sweet Sweet Beck's Badass Song, because I think it's really important to understand the historical context of this film, even more so than the information I've already provided. Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song was written and directed by Melvin Van Peebles. Van Peebles tried to break into filmmaking in the US during the 1960s, but opportunities were reserved for white men due to the institutional racism within the industry. So he started his career in France as a director where he made a film called The Story of a Three Day Pass. The film was a success and he would go on to land a three picture deal with Columbia, but he had to battle against the company for creative freedom during the production of the film Watermelon Man. And this led to Van Peebles financing the production of Sweetback on his own, which good for him. You know, nothing's worse than having your financiers, financiers or whatever, trying to stifle your creative freedom and expression. So I will say this, it took a lot of balls to, to do that. Good, good for Van Peebles. Sweet Sweet Back's Badass Song was super successful at the box office, bringing in $15 million. And that's over $100 million in today's money. And it's crazy because the budget for the film, $150,000. So it made a killing. This was a market that white Hollywood hadn't tapped into yet. So Sweetback's box office success demonstrated to white Hollywood the 
economic power black moviegoers held to the film industry. It showed Hollywood how much money black films could make. And as a result, the black exploitation film craze commenced. So watching Sweetback for the first time, I didn't know what to expect. I already mentioned that my knowledge of black exploitation films is limited to a peanut. So, and I don't even know what the hell that means. But with that in the back of my mind and not knowing anything about this film, I didn't know what to expect. I went into this blindly, completely, 100%. I didn't even do research on this until after I watched this film because I wanted to go into it with an open mind and I wanted to judge this film based on what I saw in front of me on my screen and nothing else. I am going to give you my complete 100% honest opinion on this film. My opinion. I have to say, I was equal parts intrigued, disturbed, gooped, and bewildered throughout various parts of this film. A lot of bewilderment. There was a lot of bewilderment to be had. There were moments I was rooting for Sweetback like hell, and then there were some moments where I just wanted to take my computer and just throw it in the trash can. It was an emotional roller coaster for me. And yes, as I've already stated, I understand the cultural significance of this film. It was created with a very small budget in the year of our Lord, 1971. But I'm gonna keep it a buck. And also, here is your warning. This is a very explicit film. I'm obviously not going to show everything here, but I still need to give that warning because it's, it's necessary. We start the film with a boy being fed by a group of women who awkwardly just stand there watching him eat. This boy is our main character whose name is Sweetback and he looks to be well, about 11 years old. Apparently this is supposed to be during the 1940s. I looked that part up because I had no idea when this was supposed to take place. They don't really say. And Sweetback is an orphan living in a brothel in LA where he works as a towel boy. I can only begin to imagine what that job must be like, being a towel boy for a brothel. We have such sights to show you. We move on to a scene where one of the sex workers is cleaning her lady bits as Sweetback is passing out towels. As Sweetback approaches the sex worker's room, she she brings him into her room and opens her robe. This was one of the first of many moments where I wanted to take my computer and just chuck it out my window. A very problematic scene ensues between young Sweetback and the sex worker. And I'm not going to go into great detail of describing it. Let's just say this one scene made me feel more uncomfortable than all of the baby burlesque films that I watched. I've seen this scene described twice as the sex worker seducing Sweetback. I, I personally felt like I was watching CP during this entire scene. It just crossed a line that I, I'm not comfortable with in any film. I mean, you see damn near everything in this scene between the sex worker and what looks to be about a 11 year old child. I mean, you see almost everything. And as the essay is occurring, the sex worker starts to climax while moaning, Got a sweet, sweet bag. And that is his origin story. Sweetback is now officially a, a man and he is now affectionately known as Sweetback. Flash forward some years later and Sweetback is now an adult and we quickly learn in the next scene that Mr. Sweetback is a sex performer. We see a diverse crowd of people acting as spectators at a sex show. And this was another one of those scenes where I, I just needed some clarification. You know, I didn't even know it was a sex show until I looked it up. Your girl don't frequent sex shows, so you'll have to excuse my ignorance. We see some sex workers performing, including Mr. Sweetback. And also, in case I forget to mention this, the adult version of Mr. Sweetback is played by Van Peebles. So this is the writer and director who is also starring in this film as Sweetback. As the show goes on, two LAPD officers enter the establishment to chat with Sweetback's boss, a man who goes by the name Beetle. <laughs> These names. 
A black man was murdered and the community has been on the LAPD to make an arrest. So for some strange reason, the cops visit Beetle at his sex show establishment asking if they can take Mr. Sweet back to put the blame on him temporarily and then release him shortly thereafter. Go with these gentlemen for the evening. See you tomorrow. What? I hope he's getting good benefits at this sex show place company. I bet you ain't even got a 401k doing this shit. And they probably not matching if they even did. On the way to the police station with Sweetback, Sweetback witnesses police brutality against a young Black Panther named Moo Moo. And to get the cops to stop beating this young man nearly to death, Sweetback uses his handcuffs as brass knuckles and beats the shit out of both of these cops. And he ends up putting both cops in a coma. From this point onward, we accompany Mr. Sweetback on his journey being on the lam. And this is literally the rest of the movie. Like 90% of the movie is Sweetback running from the police. Mr. Sweetback flees from the scene and meets up with his boss Beetle for help. But Beetle is too afraid to get involved. He does, however, give him some advice. And while they are having this conversation, Beetle is taking a shit. Sweetback, baby. Good, yeah. Looking good. Yeah, baby. You have to be off cool. Or what you do will affect all the rest of our little employees. We can't have that, because we got a good operation going here. <coughs> what the fuck? <coughs> And it's a really long scene. And the shit taking part is very vivid and enthusiastic, um, involved. I, I can't think of any more descriptions. It's, it's happening. Later on, the police make their way to Beetle, demanding any information he has on where Sweetback could be. Beetle tells them he doesn't know, but this answer isn't good enough for the cops. So they beat this man up so badly. They literally set a pistol off next to both of his ears and it's just brutal. I mean, yes, they have like blood come out that looks like, you know, packets of ketchup. This wasn't unusual for the time, but this was a very terrifying scene to me and literally had me sitting there just kind of holding my ears. Like it was one of those scenes. From here, things get really crazy in this film. I'm sorry, crazier. We witness the crazy shenanigans, trials, and tribulations of Mr. Sweetback as he tries to ultimately escape from the police by crossing the border into Mexico. And throughout his journey, Sweetback has to use his talents to survive. For example, he stops by an old girlfriend's house for assistance, which she declines, but then agrees to assist him with removing his handcuffs in exchange for sex. I need to be back. What you want me to do, take them off? Babe. No. You too proud to beg? I hope you wouldn't take them off if I did. <laughs> you know every goddamn thing, don't you? Well, first things first. When is this man not fucking? I truly feel for him. Later on, Moo Moo and Sweetback meet up and they encounter a group of Hell's Angels bikers in what they thought was an abandoned building. Yep, because why not? Now at the beginning of this scene, I felt a little scared, a little uneasy. I'm guessing at this point it's, you know, maybe like the 1960s, early 1970s max at this point in the film. And we have a large group of white bikers surrounding a black person. I got a little nervous, okay? It made me feel just a little nervous, you know? I really thought they were gearing up for some, for some hate crime type of ish in this next scene, you know? Some very traumatic shit that you would see in, in Roots or something, or 12 Years a Slave. But boy, oh boy, was I wrong. Nothing could have prepared me for this scene. I would have never guessed in a million years what the next scene was gonna be. The president of the club challenges Mr. Sweetback to a duel when asked what his weapon of choice was after finding out the biker gang's president was a woman, he chose his dick as his weapon of choice. What's gonna be? Uh, what's gonna be? Your choice, baby. Fucking. But what was the reason? 
I had a reason. What was the reason? I had a reason. What was the I reason? Just explained, I just explained the reason. What was the reason, bitch? I can't play the scene for you, obviously, you know. This movie does not hold back nudity at all. I mean, you see everything. You see privates, chestuses, but booty butts, you see all of it. But what I will play for you is the sound of the biker gang president's people, constituents, or whatever they call them, cheering, cheering their president on for her success in this fucking duel. Mumu and Sweetback leaves and waits in the bikers club for a member of a black biker gang called the East Bay Dragons to swoop them up. By the way, this biker is played by the legend John Amos. I learned during my research and, and also this was not the only black exploitation film I watched. I watched a few others including Coffee which I really enjoyed. It was really good. And there's a lot of actors that I didn't know got their start in black exploitation films. While waiting, two cops arrive to raid the club and a fight ensues between the two cops Moo Moo and Mr. Sweetback. The fight ends with Mr. Sweetback killing the two cops but Moo Moo is seriously wounded. A young John Amos arrives and only has room on his bike for one so Mr. Sweetback urges him to take Moo Moo. He's a young activist and he's the future. Sweetback continues to flee trying to get all the way to Mexico and meanwhile the police are frantically searching for Sweetback and will stop at nothing to find him including racially profiling random black men that have nothing to do with Sweetback. So police brutality and questioning the community on his whereabouts ensue. And the community in turn kind of goes out of its way to protect Sweetback by not snitching or just flat out saying they don't know him from Adam, which could be true for some of them, but it was given, you know, no snitch vibes. I mean, these officers are asking everybody in their mama where Sweetback is, literally. They, they literally ask Sweetback's mama where he is. And then a series of awkward as hell scenes ensue with close-ups of people saying they have no idea who Sweetback is or where he is. And some of these scenes are just flat out hilarious but I don't think they were meant to be hilarious. For example, check this guy out. I've been looking for myself. He doesn't do the best job at sounding like he don't know anything. And maybe that's intentional. And then there's this guy. I haven't seen it. And this guy. No. Other people, I don't give a damn about it. I don't know nobody but my own goddamn shit. That man is an absolute king. He reminds me of a couple of my uncles. <laughs> From here on, Sweetback continues to run. I mean, really, he hasn't stopped running, but he's running and running and running until he makes his way to the border of Tijuana. He's living off the land and eating lizards and drinking water from puddles in the ground. But the police are hot on his trail and they borrow two hunting dogs from a farmer. They release the dogs to hunt Sweetback down and Sweetback ultimately stabs the dogs in self-defense and makes his way over the border. And there's a there's a scene of the, 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 the dog floating in the water or laying in the water dead. Um, based on the quality of this film and the budget i don't even know even if they had the budget if they would be able to have the means to make a dead dog look that realistic um that looked real i, I did do some research to see if i could find anything about it i don't you know i don't know i couldn't really find much except for spe speculation people talk about or whatever and that they heard this or heard that i came across some message board where they were talking about oh you know i heard from this person and that person that he you know got uh two already dead dogs from a shelter um it is definitely disturbing although it is not the first time this has happened in, in cinema, so yeah. The film ends with a still screen and a message conveying Sweetback's intent to return and exact his revenge. And then the most chaotic end credits I have ever seen or heard in my life starts up and it is just nightmare fuel. <laughs> I couldn't take much of that. And that was Sweet Sweetback's badass song. Here are my final thoughts. 
Like I've already said, I understand the cultural significance of this film, including a lot of the social issues it's attempting to tackle. Some of those issues being police brutality, systemic racism, and I would also argue the black man's sexuality as a performance. I think that was definitely portrayed a lot in this film. You know, one of the stereotypes that I mentioned earlier in this video that spawned out of slavery and segregation was the Mandingo Buck stereotype that was placed upon black men. So this could be a, a connection that the film is trying to make. Throughout almost this entire film, I felt like I was being bombarded back to back with nothing but shock value, just shock entertainment. Now there's nothing wrong with using shock entertainment to try to convey a message, you know, in order to bring awareness to a cultural issue from time to time, like, okay, fine. However, I do not need it beaten over my head over and over again. And it can also get to a point where the message can become lost with this approach being overdone. And if we briefly set aside the cultural significance of this film and focus purely on the aesthetic, the plot, and the writing, I did not enjoy it at all. It felt like a student art film that was attempting to be super abstract. And I was confused for about 80% of the film. And like I've said already, I mean, I really had to look stuff up after the fact because I was so lost. For example, the biker gang fuck duel. There was no explanation. The quality is so bad that you don't really know what's going on. So even if they are talking, I, I, I can't hear anything. I can't see anything thing either. There didn't appear to be any rhyme or reason to some of the scenes and how they played out. Each scene almost felt like an independent short film unrelated to each other. And what really made it difficult for me to enjoy this film was the editing choices. Oh Lord! The editing choices really added to the confusion. There's a lot of zooming in and out, abrupt transitions, really low lighting to the point where you can hardly see anything. And oh my God, there's a lot of overlaying scenes for the love of God. The amount of scene overlays. Look at this, look at this. Well, 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 well. I did not edit this at all. This, all that was original. Just a lot of strange editing choices. And of course, the acting was really bad. And speaking of acting, Van Peebles, who I already mentioned is playing Sweetback and also wrote and directed the film, barely says a word throughout the entire film. They had this man either running or screwing for 90% of it. And maybe that was an artistic choice, but as a viewer who's trying to receive the message, I, I don't know if there was a point to it or not, honestly. I didn't receive it. And then, oh my God, the running. I mean, there was so much running in this film. And I'm sure somebody's gonna argue the, the significance to the all the running scenes and also potentially all the other shortcomings of this film that I mentioned previously. At the end of the day, I need to actually be able to see what's going on, hear what's going on, and understand what's going on to understand what you are trying to convey. And there's one more thing I'd like to add in my review. The music. My God. Some of the music's not bad, you know what I mean? Not all of it is terrible, but a good chunk is. And the parts that are bad are, is, are some of the most chaotic shit I've ever heard in my life. And I can already hear someone saying something like, but the chaotic instrumentals combined with the vocals is a reflection of Sweetback's level of desperation while on the run. Sure. I read online that the music was performed by Earth, Wind and Fire, who I love. So I was really surprised when I learned that, but it also said it was written by Van Peebles. So maybe they only performed it and had nothing to do with the writing aspect. And that was just Van Peebles. As a lover of black cinema and being black, I do understand the historical and cultural importance of this film. And I do not want to minimize that in any way. This film had to happen or another film like it had to happen in order for us to get to where we are in entertainment today when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as an aside, I do not think that you have to be black in order to understand the importance of this film. Just an FYI. 
This film opened the door for black cinema and ultimately allowed for new eras of black entertainment to enter the chat. It is because of this film that we have films like Get Out and shows like Atlanta or Insecure. But just judging this film on its own, if I was an alien and I came here to planet Earth and I didn't know anything about you, you humans, history, I would not like this at all. I would never watch it again. And I don't think that its significance and impact should encourage dishonesty about the quality of this film. And yes, this film had a low budget, but they could have done way less of this shit for free during the editing phase. Anyway, I don't think I'll be watching it again. I give it a four out of 10. Have a good evening. Bye. Ooh, people ain't gonna like that. I was real, real feisty about it. <laughs>